Hey, it's good to see you on tonight. I'm excited to be talking about some really cool stuff, which is the John Coltrane Circle. Tonight. This has been a long time coming. It's going to be an interesting one. So I'm so excited that you're here. Um, as always, I'm excited to show you, <laughs> show you myself. I'm showing my screen there, or my uh, keyboard. Okay, so this is going to be cool. We're going to talk about the John Coltrane Circle. And as always, let me know where you're coming from. Uh, we're going to talk through some questions at the end, and uh, if you're part of the replay crew, let me know where you're coming from. So, uh, very cool. I am so excited you're here, and uh, thank you for for your feedback on the course. I'm excited that you're going through the course, and there's a lot of stuff. Music theory is a beautiful thing, and uh, it's cool to connect with, with cool cats like you. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, and also, Stephen, we're going to rock and roll tonight, and we're going to talk some cool theory. Uh, theory looks as good and, and uh, as, as music sounds. Um, so we're going to jump in. Uh, Rick in the morning, it's cool to see you on. And Rodney, right on. Um, yeah, uh, you're right. The Coltrane died in 1967. And, uh, that's going to kind of play into, I think, what we're going to see here. And John White, very cool. It is time to geek out. So we're going to geek out on some cool music theory. Um, all right. Let me uh, just make sure. Okay. I think uh, I'm getting my, my sound correct. I think it's because I'm moving this paper over my laptop, and that might be the this, this sound that you're hearing. So we'll try to clean that up. Okay. So John Coltrane, if you don't know, he is... He was an American jazz saxophonist who lived from 1926 to 1967. He was almost 41 when he died, uh, but he was 40. And in 19, well, let's, let's, let's put a face to a name here. And this is John Coltrane. And he was, you know, if you've heard any of his stuff, super talented, made some amazing music. And so this is him looking thoughtfully off to the side. And the diagram that we're going to talk about is uh, pretty well known. If you look it up online, you may have already seen it before. Um, it is this very esoteric looking diagram that there's a lot of a, a lot of lore around this or a lot of mystery because it has some kind of uh, sacred geometry vibes going on. Um, it also he he was into some mysticism and some of some, he was on like a spiritual journey. And so that plays into it. I think anytime someone dies young, there's also kind of like an extra reverence for things. And so this diagram, you know, it's, it's steeped in, in mystery, like I say. And so uh, we're going to kind of look into it, not kind of look into it, we're going to totally look at it with x-ray vision, with the x-ray vision of music theory to make sense of what we're seeing. Um, and what we see is amazing. So uh, like I say, though, it, it's, it's steeped in this mystery and lore, almost to the point it's, it's so revered, it's, it almost feels like, like this relic, like a, almost like a religious relic kind of like the Shroud of Turin, <laughs> where it's this like mystery of how, how, what's the story behind that? What's, you know, what's under the surface? How, how is this image formed? Um, and so we're going to look at it, like I say, and Thelonious Monk uh, was quoted as, as saying once that all musicians are subconsciously mathematicians. Subconsciously is the operative term there because it's not necessarily conscious, but music is mathematics in the sense that it is geometry. Music is geometry. And we talk about that in a lot of videos and other videos um, here. We get into the, the underlying geometry of music and John Coltrane's diagram is no exception. It really highlights that geometry in some cool ways. Though when you first see it, it is, you know, like one, it's, it's kind of a, a quick sketch. You know, the, the scribbles, there are some, and we're going to get into this, but there are some uh, some scribbles, some cross out numbers, uh, loses some of the symmetry over here. Um, there's this, you know, faded star, which, you know, 
is kind of like hiding, but in plain sight. So we're going to use music theory to really get into this. And uh, here are the two diagrams side by side. On the right is John Coltrane's uh, diagram that they, they think that he sketched this in 1961. Uh, so he was about 34. And uh, according to his friend who he gave it to after like a session of playing, uh, he said this was just one of many that he did, which makes sense. I mean, it's not like you just whip this out for once and for all and you're you never even explore this again. Like this is this is one of many diagrams that you did. And we're going to use color music to really pick it apart and see what's going on here. So with that said, let's get into what's going on here. OK, so we're going to we're going to uh, dissect this one layer at a time because it is multi-layered and it looks awesome, right? <laughs> like, it is uh, it is mystical. It seems like we're we're ascending to another level when we look at this. And so uh, wh what we're going to do is, like I say, strip away some of the layers. And first, we're just going to start with the foundational layer of the notes. So what we have here are two concentric rings. And around the outer edge are whole steps. So this outer edge of squares, you can see are whole steps. And then this inner ring are another set of whole steps, all the circles. So this kind of uh, brings us back to, you know, sometimes I'll get asked the question, hey, with color music, what's up with the squares and circles? Like what's the significance? And so uh, again, just to, to touch on this, the squares and circles, like if we look at just a keyboard here, if that volume is okay. Um, all of the squares are evenly spaced and then all of the circles are evenly spaced as well. It's just two sets of whole tones or whole steps. So that's what, that's what we're looking at here is we have the, uh, the notes of C, D, E, F sharp, A flat, B flat, C, D, E, F sharp, A flat, B flat, and so on. Likewise, we have C sharp, E flat, F, G, A, B, C sharp, E flat, F, G, A, B, and so on. So you'll see here too, like, and I mapped this to Coltrane's map uh, using the same symbol. So in some instances, for example, you have like a C sharp, a C sharp, and then you have, uh, you know, a C sharp here, a C sharp here. They're all C sharps, except for this one. For some reason, he marked it as a D flat. It's just the enharmonic name, the synonymous name for C sharp. Um, likewise, you know, you might have like an E flat here. You have an E flat here. There's an E flat here, and then a D sharp, and then an E flat. So he that adds a little bit to the seeming complexity of this diagram is that different and harmonic names are used in different positions, but they're the same notes. So really it's just two concentric rings of whole steps. And we're going to, we're going to return to this, the significance of why he used whole steps. It is in essence, well, we'll see here in a sec. So the next layer we're going to add, are these groupings. So in the diagram, he has these kind of like sausage shaped groupings <laughs> for lack of a better description. Um, and so all of these different groupings group different sets of notes, okay? So what's up with that? Like what what is going on here? Well, if you notice the notes that are highlighted by the overlapping groupings are a circle of fourths. So we have, uh, we're going to move in a, in a clockwise direction here. We have C and then F and then B flat and then E flat, A flat, uh, D flat, G flat, B, uh, E, A, D, G, and C. So going in a clockwise direction, those are fourths. Or in a counterclockwise direction, 
it's just, you know, C and then G and then D and A and so on. So it's the reverse of how we normally think of the circle of fifths. Most of the time, uh, when people picture the circle of fifths, uh, they, they think of it in a reverse direction. So we'll look at that in one sec. But just to kind of like see this a little more clearly, if we fade out all of the other notes, you can see all of those where all of the sausages overlap, <laughs> to use the sausage example or illustration, we have the circle of fourths. Again, C's fourth is F, F's fourth is B flat, B flat's fourth is E flat. Other direction, C's fifth is G, G's fifth is D, D's fifth is A, and so on. So we have a circle of fifths or a circle of fourths. Now, the way that a lot of people picture it, just in terms of how it's formed and why it's typically called the circle of fifths, is because in when you take all of the major scales, all of the tetrachords or four note segments of each major scale in every key, you have, here's the first half of the C major scale, that tetrachord. The second tetrachord is, you know, G, A, B, C. And then you get this tetrachord is the first half of the D major scale. This tetrachord starts the A major scale and so on. So because it's, it's going in uh, the pattern of whole, whole, half, whole, 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 uh, half, that is the major scale. And so in this direction, you have a fifth and then a fifth and then a fifth. So the fifths are in a clockwise direction. Then you have a fourth, a fourth, a fourth. The fourths are in a counterclockwise direction. Whereas in Coltrane's circle, because it's not basing it on the daisy chain pattern of major scales, he's just using semitones of C to E uh, to C sharp, to D to E flat, to E to F it's just a quicker route. You just get to the fourth. You don't have to go through so many steps to get to the fifth, which is a little further away as you rise. Uh, likewise, it's a shorter path going in a counterclockwise direction from C to a half step to B to B flat to A to A flat to G. And so that's why in moving in this direction, they're fifths in a counterclockwise direction and in a clockwise direction, they're fourths. So it's the reverse of how we typically think of it. But it's the circle of fifths, it's the circle of fourths, depending on which direction you're moving. And it's formed, like I say, by these two uh, concentric rings of whole step intervals that together form the chromatic scale. Like if you go through these notes uh, just a step at a time, it's C to C sharp to D to D, uh, E flat to E to F to F sharp to G to A flat to A to B flat to B to C. That's a chromatic scale. That's just one octave of the chromatic scale. And then if you continue on, C to C sharp to D to E flat to E to F to F sharp, G, A flat, A, B flat, B, and C, that's another octave of C, okay? So we're just going through different octaves of the chromatic scale. So rather than, again, I, I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but to give it that horse one more lashing, we have Coltrane's circle of fifths or circle of fourths is built by just chromatic scales it's not really factoring the major scale in so much. Whereas the typical way that we often think of the circle of fifths is building the circle of fifths is a daisy chain pattern of major scales. There is an underlying chromatic scale going on here, but because of that major scale formation, circle of fifths in a clockwise direction, if that makes sense. And I can talk through that more if I'm speaking a little too fast, but just to highlight the typical depiction and what we're seeing here is the circle of fifths using a piano keyboard, for example, it's that whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half pattern where you're moving, you know, each successive fifth is analogous to the color wheel, which allows us to see music in color. Okay, so that is the circle of fifths. Back to Coltrane circle, circle of fourths, circle of fifths. So we have these overlapping segments that highlight those fifths or fourths, depending on the direction you're moving in. And so, that, so, so far we have the notes, which are arranged in two concentric rings of whole step intervals. Then we have these overlapping groupings or sausages, <laughs> as I've described them, as uh, highlighting intervals of fourths and fifths. The next 
thing that is highlighted is he has this star and these numbers, these boxed numbers around the perimeter. And really what those are just highlighting, it just happens to be focusing on C, that this is the first instance of C. And then because this is a chromatic scale rising up to the next octave or instance of C, we have a C there. And then the next chromatic scale brings us to the next instance of C and so on. So three, four, five, and back to one. So because it takes five octaves to, to form this ring, he, when he connects all of those C's, it forms this pentagram five, highlighting the fact that there are five octaves. Now he could have highlighted, the star could have pointed to all of the D's. So for instance, let's take this D, I'm gonna mark it with an arrow. And let's take this D and mark it with an arrow. And this D, mark it with an arrow, because in every, every octave, the notes are in the same position relative to each other. So you can see if, if we were to form a star between all of the Ds, there's a star there too. So there's not specifically like some great significance around the C note. It's just that often C is in that, to use a clock metaphor, that 12 o'clock position at the very top. And so it's often oriented as the North Star, or as the, the top point. And that's why C then got that top position and is emphasized with the star. But it's just the star is just pointing out that there are five octaves of every note in this in this diagram. OK, so we have two concentric just to recap as we go, like layer by layer. We have two concentric rings of whole step intervals. The squares on the outside, the circles on the inside. Then we have, and, and these, these, this star formation, like he has these like traced lines. It's just, and they're not super symmetrical. I mean, I'm doing this by hand and they're not as symmetrical as when I created it with an illustration app, but they're just highlighting all of the half step or semitone intervals that form this, this ring. And because there are five octaves, five times 12, there's 60, 60 uh, spots in this, in this circle. Okay, so then the next layer, oh, well, actually on the point of 60. So because of the way that the circle of fifths is often depicted and it takes, it takes more distance to get around the ring because we're basing it on the major scale, not the chromatic scale, uh, there are actually 84 spots, which is basically 60, 84 minus 60 is 14. And uh, that basically just means that we're missing uh, two octaves, or, or, or in this instance, we have two extra octaves. Sorry, I'm trying to talk and think at the same time. <laughs> we have, uh, this, this has two plus two octaves uh, in this illustration, as opposed to the five octaves that Coltrane has in his circle. So that's why it looks a little different. It looks a little more compact. It's a little smaller because again, it's based on chromatic scales, not major scales. Okay, so then you get these really cool, and this is where it starts getting especially visually interesting is, and so I'm fading out all the stuff that we've already already covered, like the, the sausage groupings and the octave star and, and all of that. So now we're focusing on these petals. They almost look like, butterfly wings or flower petals. And um, basically what Coltrane is, is looking at is how each note is flanked by two notes. Like this C, for example, is flanked by B and C sharp. Whereas <clears throat> its polar opposite, G flat, is flanked by F and G. And so in other videos, we've talked about this, that these two notes that are perfectly across from each other, you know, the polar opposites, in this case, this would be C would be the North Pole and G flat, its tritone is the South Pole and C is flanked by the respective fourth and fifth notes of its tritone, G flat. And G flat is flanked by C's respective perfect fourth and perfect fifth, F and G. 
So all of these pedals, like let's just pick E. E is surrounded by D sharp and F. It wants to be where B flat is. B flat is E's polar opposite. And in reverse, E is B flat's polar opposite. So E uh, B flat wants to be nestled between its two friends, which you can see with the colors. It wants to be between D sharp and F or E flat and F as the enharmonic equivalents. E wants to be between A and B because those are E's respective subdominant and dominant or fourth and fifth. And this same relationship is, is consistent anywhere you are in the circle. So no matter where you are, tritones are highlighted as being surrounded by or flanked by the notes of its polar opposite. And so these pedals highlight that special relationship between tritones. So uh, it's really highlighting the fact that we're looking at the tritones. The tritones are a significant interval in music as we talk about in, in color music all the time, because again, the major scales with this circle of fifths, the major scales form this daisy chain pattern of overlapping major scales, which uh, shows how just as all keys overlap in music, all colors bleed seamlessly into each other to form the color wheel. So the color wheel and the circle of fifths are not only analogous, they are visual and audible representations of the same underlying patterns. And once we have the circle of fifths, if we just take all of those notes and condense them down into the circle of fifths, we just have a color wheel. And then when we swap every other note, in other words, tritones, one set of tritones, the circles in this case, and we rotate them 180 degrees, we get the chromatic scale. So C is opposite its fourth and fifth. In other words, G flat is flanked by F and G, the two notes that are closely related to C, and C is flanked by B and D flat, the two notes that are closely related to G flat. So that tritone relationship, that tritone interval is fundamental to music theory. And the colors highlight this relationship. We're just focusing on C and G flat, but the same is true for, like if we just do it just for fun, a flat is surrounded by G and A, which are the perfect fourth and fifth of D, A flat's tritone, and D is flanked by D flat and A flat, the fourth and fifth of A flat. So it's consistent for all 12 keys in music. So Coltrane is, is winking at us saying, hey everyone, tritones, they're important. They're really important. And the next layer that we're gonna look at highlights that even more. Uh, just as a quick synopsis, because I was showing it in the last diagram, that the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale are really just rearrangements of one another. They are permutations of the same pattern. It's this fractal, symmetrical, self-referential pattern that's going on, uh, which, which is <laughs> what powers everything in music from scales and modes to chords and progressions. Okay, so tritones are awesome. And Coltrane, he gives us the wink wink with the star petals or with these butterfly wings, right? Saying tritones are important. But so we don't miss that point, he, these numbers emphasize the relationship, the reverse symmetry between tritones even further. So for example, these numbers are what he maps here as one. Let's say C is one. Now these are not scale degrees in the sense of major scales, he, these numbers are highlighting like integers, the different half steps of the chromatic scale. So he's saying one and then two. So a half step away from C is B. And then three, another half step is B flat. Four, another half step is A. Another half step is A flat. Another half step is G. And then seven. Seven reaches the tritone of uh, C's tritone. So one and seven are like as far away as you can get in, in music in the chromatic scale, just to show that here. If we say one, two, three, uh, you know what? He went in the reverse direction. So let's do it right like this. So one, two, three, oh, it's supposed to be a three, <laughs> three, four, 
five, six, seven. He's saying, hey, everyone, if you missed it with the petals, with the butterfly wings, the tritones are important. They are fundamental to music. And just in case we missed it, he shows it in the reverse. Now, if we say that F sharp is one, we count up all the half steps, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We're saying that, hey, just as C's tritone is F sharp, F sharp's tritone is C, which you can see here. If we make this, uh, we're going to just back this up so that we can we can call this a one and then see if I can write upside down two, three, uh, four, it's supposed to be a four and then five, six, and then this becomes seven. So again, he's saying, hey, in case you missed it yet again, <laughs> the one and the seven here are highlighting the fact that tritones, say it with me, are super important and fundamental in music. So, and then just to show it again <laughs> in both directions. So he's got uh, these numbers. So this is the one, this is the seven. And then going, so that was in a counterclockwise direction. In a clockwise direction, the seventh position is yet again an F sharp. And then if you go in the reverse direction, one to seven, that's a tritone. So we have tritones. And again, he's just focusing on a, a C, you know, with all of these octaves forming the star, but the pedals, the numbers, the uh, the concentric rings of whole steps, like all of it is saying like these tritones are fundamental uh, to music. And and of course, there's the circle of fifths. So the, the sausage groupings highlight the circle of fifths or fourths, depending on the direction you move in. But the circle of fifths, tritones, the chromatic scale, it all comes together in this relationship between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale and how they're linked by this rotation of tritones. Now, he didn't illustrate that. You can't deduce that from this diagram. Um, that's, that's color music is showing us that relationship and that rotation between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale. Um, so we have the benefit of seeing it uh, with a kind of musical x-ray vision here. Uh, but in essence, I mean, whether you're using color or not, the fact remains that tritones, <laughs> the circle of fists, the chromatic scale, they're all, it's like the ingredients, or they're all like, they all merge to, to reveal this fractal self-referential, beautiful geometry of music. Now, in this diagram, these pieces are, it's kind of a complex relationship and depiction between all of these things. Whereas with these diagrams, it's more just like succinct, like, Hey, you get the circle of fifths, you rotate it by taking one set of whole tones. In this case, the circles rotate them 180 degrees, which in essence swaps the tritones and you get the chromatic scale. And those relationships are still baked in. You can see that, you know, the notes are across from their tritones that are flanked by their friends and all of that. So, this is, you know, a more succinct depiction of what's going on here, but he's, he's highlighting or he's like getting at these special relationships. Again, tritones, chromatic scale, circle of fifths, special relationships there. Uh, let's see. So if we look at all of the layers again, um, it's kind of visually busy in a way, which lends to its kind of uh, hinting at almost like the occult or some kind of mystical power. Uh, but there's some interesting things. I, um, like one of the things that is highlighted here is this, and, and I, I read this, actually, I, was, I hadn't really dissected this diagram until literally yesterday. <laughs> but someone had asked, Rick, thank you, in on Locals had asked, hey, will you describe the Coltrane Circle? So I was like, let me let me look at it because I know obviously John Coltrane understood geometry, uh, the geometry of music. I mean, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> like it's it's staring us in the face. Music is clearly geometric, um, but it was interesting to look at it through the lens of color to see what's going on here. And uh, one of the things that 
I read yesterday, which was a little bit of a stretch, but kind of cool. It was interesting. Was let's look at. Uh, I guess we'll get this version. Is with the circle of fifths. You know, you have. Uh, let's take the C, E, and A flat, which with color they're you know the primary colors. And if you take the secondary colors, all the other notes that are spaced at whole step intervals, you have, you know, G flat, D and B flat, you know, if you form augmented chords or perfect triangles between those two sets of, oh, two sets of triangles, you have this hexagram. So let's draw that a little more clearly. So you have this hexagram uh, with these whole step intervals. And then you have this underlying pentagram with the five notes. And someone had pointed out on some message board that it's the pentagram. What does it mean? The pentagram and the hexagram together symbolize what's called mystical marriage um, of the micro and macrocosms, the inner and outer worlds, or as they say, as above, so below, which is super interesting. Um, we talk about, especially like in the music theory course on locals, um, I talk about, you know, the microcosms and macrocosms because music is fractal in this way in that the same subsets of notes at the atomic level between, you know, notes and intervals manifests itself in scales, which is self-referential. Those scales form the circle of fifths, which then can be rotated through this symmetrical rotation of tritones into the chromatic scale. So it like comes back to itself. And then the chromatic scale forms major scales, which uh, from which are derived chords, different modes, chord progressions. And it's all like everything's interrelated on the micro and macro cosms. So as above, so below is actually a, a cool way to put it with uh, what's it called? This is called a double power. I guess the pentagram and the hexagram combined are a double double power symbol, which is really cool. Um, okay, so Coltrane's original drawing, this is, you know, you can see it as it originally uh, was drawn. Um, you know, without the color, we're losing some of that. I mean, it's not as readily apparent, but once you see it, it's kind of hard to miss the fact that you have all of these C notes. Oops, I uh, circled the wrong one. C, C. C and C with the red squares, it's easier. They jump out at you and the relationship between C and its tritone or polar opposite, you know, it, it's not as readily apparent, but he had John Coltrane had the x-ray vision of music theory uh, to arm him in the process. And, you know, there are diagrams. I think this diagram was, um, you know, a similar kind of thing showing relationships. The geometry of music has been, recognized for a long time. I think this is an actual um, an actual diagram from like, I don't know if it's like the 18th century or maybe even the 17th century. Um, but you know if if you can see it with color, it's almost like this underlying like it's explaining what's really going on uh, and and helps you you know see what is obscured on the surface. If you're just using black and white, and these, you know, lots of symbols, it can seem like it's more complicated or more esoteric than it is. It is amazingly beautiful, uh, but it's more understandable and relatable uh, if you can see it uh, for what it really is. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in other videos I have here, and I've talked a bit about this, is like, you can even expand the circle of fifths to incorporate the circle of thirds and amazing relationships between chords, keys, modes, different extended chords and all of that. And I talk about this diagram in another video and we'll, we'll return to it as well because it's full of uh, really cool stuff. And of course, you know, with, um, with the circle of fifths, you know, we've been dissecting it just in our heads, but we can use it you know, as a functional, as an actual functional tool to interact with music and, and create songs, you know, in different keys and different modes and to see this, this symmetry and these relationships between tritones and all of that in a very practical way beyond just, you know, 
so it's not just part of the GWiz file, stuffing stuffing our GWiz file with factoids, but applying them to fill the air with with music, with sound. Uh, so John Coltrane was amazingly insightful. Like it's super cool uh, to to draw this and on the fly too. Like like I say, all of these spokes in his, the sixty spokes to even just draw that out just takes the dedication and love of someone who is clearly passionate about this amazing art form that is as much a science as it is an art. Um, so it's actually uh, unfortunate that he died so young. Um, and it would be interesting to see some of the other diagrams that he did because this one is, is super insightful and very cool in what it reveals. I'm going to have all of these diagrams in the library. So I'll be posting those uh, here. I commit to doing it tomorrow. The last couple of live streams I've done, I've been a little slow on the upload of diagrams that follow these live streams, uh, because I've been so focused on lesson 15, which is coming along very well. So le lesson 15 is, uh, will be released in October. So more to come on that. Um, but I am going to get these diagrams that we've been looking at, uh, posted in the library. So let's see. So you can like, soak it in at your own pace. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into some of the comments here and see if there are any Coltrane fans in the house. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, Rick in the morning. So I'm, I'm glad that you're excited about this. Uh, this is like super fun. I mean, I have this summary sheet of, of diagrams that I'm referring to just to kind of know where I'm going. And it is just like super cool. Like all of these, it does feel like we're, you know, in some mystical realm because <laughs> they're like really cool diagrams. And yeah, that's cool that you've explored the rabbit hole. And I'm interested to know, you know, what else, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not addressing that is, is hiding in plain sight in this diagram. Um, very cool. Okay. So, uh, it's good to see you on Rick. Um, and in LA as always, that's awesome. Uh, okay. So Rodney, so hope you have some music examples. So I haven't talked about, you know, like giant steps or my favorite things or some of the Coltrane songs, like not applying necessarily the insights of this diagram in specific song examples. Uh, but dissecting the diagram itself so you can see the significance of these different layers because it has there's there's a lot going on it's kind of a busy looking diagram and it has a lot of uh a lot of elements um yes and let's see i'm just getting through the i like many vibes this is the meditation look of with the sunglasses and yes um, the, you could meditate on this diagram for a long time because there, there are a lot of elements going on. Um, so potato math experienced me thinks, yeah, for sure. Thelonious monk was math experienced. Any jazz musician is math experienced, um, as is, uh, John Coltrane. And, and that's the thing is like, when we talk about math, we're not necessarily saying he, he, he was getting out his protractor or, you know, a calculator and, and doing a whole lot. The numbers in that diagram simply represent half step intervals um, or the octaves, the numbers around the ring. But uh, the math of music is inherently geometric. And by geometric, I mean, you know, we're not calculating the angles or, you know, the hypotenuse of a triangle or any of that purely ge geometry in the sense of, movement through space because music is movement through in relationships and audible space in terms of intervals and harmonic relationships and all that. Uh, Dave Mercer, so cool to see you on. And I love geeking out with you. I love it. Um, uh, so let's see. Uh, <laughs> key music. Yes. Musical sausages. <laughs> I know the, the description of those, uh, groupings around the circle of fifths. I don't know if I'm doing it justice by referring to them as sausages, but um, many vibes, a perfect circle is, is a more, a beautiful way to describe what's going on here. 
Um, yes. So, um, let's see. Just kind of going through here. Um, Rick in the morning, there's a light bulb. I'm glad there was a light bulb. Hopefully it was a good light bulb. Uh, not like a black light that's disorienting, <laughs> but, but illuminating. Um, yeah, so it is like a color wheel potato. The circle of fists and the, uh, the color wheel are not only analogous, but they are in fact the same pattern. Color, the natural patterns of color, the color wheel, perfectly mirror or follow the same patterns, the otherwise invisible patterns of the circle of fifths because of their formation and what they represent. Uh, and once you can see things in color, see these patterns in color, it's not an arbitrary relationship, but they are in essence the same thing. Uh, then all of these otherwise esoteric confusing terms like subdominance and dominance or tritones or you know subtonics and supertonics and all of these terms uh, can make sense because the colors are showing you uh, what's going on. Now, I'm just kind of waving my arms and gesticulating <laughs> relationships between tritones like that, but um, you know the diagrams spell it out in more detail. Um, that one Geo Girl, I love this. I love this too. Music is awesome, and it's fun to geek out with you on all of this cool stuff. Um, all right, so yeah, so potato, and you you were ahead of me on this in my comments about color. Yeah, so color wheels have complementary analogous triadic tetradic relationships. And those relationships, it's interesting because color music is like the Rosetta Stone, if you're familiar with that. Um, in history, Napoleon hit the French army came to Egypt uh, to Rosetta, which is a town there. And they found for the longest time, no one in, in modern life could read uh, the Egyptian hieroglyph hieroglyphics. Uh, it was in a language that had been lost. And uh, Napoleon's army, there were some soldiers who found this like pillar or this like rock, the Rosetta Stone, that had segments of three different languages on it. It had uh, Hebrew, Greek, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. And because they matched, like they were saying it was a decree, like an ancient decree from back in the day. And because the language, maybe everyone knows Rose, Rosetta Stone. So <laughs> I might be belaboring common knowledge here, but just to finish out the thought, the known language being above the unknown language of hieroglyphs, people were able to translate the hieroglyphs and like, oh, that's what that symbol means because we know what it means there. The same, uh, and so it unlocked Egyptian hieroglyphics. And music, especially through the traditional symbols of notation and tablature and all of that, is like our modern day hieroglyphics. It's this esoteric, confusing symbol set that is hard to understand, but with color, using colors and the relationships like you describe, that we, we know, we know about triangles, you know, we know about these geometric relationships between color, we can use the vocabulary and understanding of color patterns to map perfectly onto the patterns of music with its seemingly more convoluted terminology to, you know, you know, complementary colors. What are tritones? Oh, tritones and complementary colors are the same thing. So that's what I mean by the Rosetta Stone. That was kind of a longer explanation, but you're totally right. Um, Rick in the morning. I find this fascinating too. I think John Coltrane's diagram is such a cool, because a lot of people don't know about music theory or even know that music is geometric. So when they see something like Coltrane's circle, it's like, oh, wow, that guy was like really good. Like he was a really good musician. Maybe there is something to music theory. Maybe music is geometric. Um, and it is. Um, a love supreme, many vibes, yes. A supreme love. Their music is is a beautiful thing. Um, okay, so that's awesome. So Rick in the morning said, "Yeah, I was going down the rabbit hole, and I figured you'd be able to clear that up." Hopefully, this was uh, clarifying. And I haven't gotten to any comments where if 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 there's more that I can cover on this diagram, I'd love to. Um, so 
Scott, the movement is the same path as the planet Venus. It forms a pentacle. That's interesting. So like in the night sky, Venus, um, like over time forms a pattern like that. Is that, is that what you mean? If so, that's really interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Sacred geometry, uh, music is the reason we find it so fascinating is like, it's the language of the universe and all of these patterns are, are natural, uh, beautiful things. Um, yeah, yin yang. So, uh, many vibes. If you haven't checked out lesson 14, I just posted lesson 14 in the music theory course and we get into the yin yang, uh, and how it informs the structure of songs. Um, I use the Beatles song drive my car as a perfect representation of the yin yang in terms of song sections and change and repetition and how it balances each other out and each gives the other context. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're on the same wavelength in terms of all, all this cool stuff. Cause it's all music is more than just sound. It is an insight into how so many things work. That's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, Mandala designs, uh, that's a good point. Uh, and more on that, there's actually, uh, more that I'll cover in terms of the cross pollination of ideas. And, and we see these, these geometric diagrams and, uh, things across all cultures and music is this beautiful thing across all cultures. And it's not coincidental. There's some really cool stuff that we haven't even, we haven't even touched on here, guys. There's, there's a lot. We're going to get into. Um, so um, let's see. Okay. Uh, you said that one geo girl. I like how you take your time to explain. I really like the idea of using color. Awesome. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, music. That's the thing about music is it's this beautiful, uh, this beautiful thing. And I'm <laughs> not even like doing it justice you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, we're here because we, we love it. So it's this amazing way to connect with yourself and with others and the universe. And the irony of the complicated way that music is traditionally depicted, the irony of that is that it makes it seem more difficult than it is. And so it's the ultimate blocker uh, and buzzkill to having that connection. So when, when you're, you're faced with, which we've all experienced, I know I've had this experience when I first got into music theory was I wanted music theory to be my pathway to enlightenment and to connection. And for the traditional symbols of tablature or notation and all of these complex symbols to keep me from that was an existential uh, dilemma and I'm not overstating it. And so, uh, I'm glad to hear it because that is what this is all about is to, uh, make it accessible, make it so that you can just get past the friction to the pure joy of creation. Um, I'm waxing philosophical right now. Cause it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful night for that. So, um, yeah, music maps are fascinating, many vibes and, uh, Mapping things out is the key. Music theory means to see sound by definition and maps are visual layouts of geography. Geo is the graphy or, or the, the graphing of space. Geometry is the measurement of space. So it makes sense that geometry, geography, music theory, it's, it's all the same stuff. We're talking about the relationships between spatial elements, whether it's physical space or music, musical auditory space, and also relationships, whether they are, you know, contextual points along the yin yang or within space, like it's the planet Venus compared to earth, or it's a tonic and it's tritone. It's all the same stuff, right? Like we're just looking at it and using different terminology based on different disciplines, but every discipline or every art form is really just a different perspective on the same whatever this is that's going on. Um, all right. So, uh, so I'm, uh, wonder Rick in the morning said, so I wonder why he did the single digits on the right side. So yeah, let me, uh, 
pull that up because that's a good point. And I kind of glossed over it. Um, well, I didn't kind of gloss over I definitely glossed over it, but there's a reason for that. So let me pull it up. I'm going to share my screen here in one moment once I find the diagram. Man, there's a lot of diagrams. Um, okay, so here we have... So I focused on these symmetrical numbers highlighting the tritones. He was basically getting at that. And there's some speculation that the he here was not actually John Coltrane. Uh, I saw an analysis where they took his notes on different uh, like sheet music of songs that he performed uh, to, to do a handwriting analysis to see if it was actually his handwriting um, or if it was someone else after the fact. He gave, like I say, he gave this to a friend in 1961 who published it in his own other book. Um, so it might have been the friend, it might have been someone else, but all that to say, you can see here, they get kind of confusing because B flat suddenly becomes the one. And then you can see here that this used to be a two and then they changed it to a six. This used to be a three and they changed it to a seven. And then, oh, this became a one. So I think it's because someone, acts, someone whether it was John Coltrane or someone else, accidentally marked B flat as one which kind of broke down the whole numbering and that's why these numbers get scribbly. But the, the correction does bring it back to, and then they just kind of stop. So there may be more significance than that. I think it, it was uh, an oops. And so uh, rather than incorporating that into the diagram, I just focused on what I think the intention was there. All right. Um, so, uh, let me get to, okay, so Tony, you said very informative to take part. Will this be available uh, once live? Uh, uh, you, oh, so since you missed the first 20 minutes. Yes, so this live stream will just be on the channel after uh, this, after we wrap it up here. And then like I say, I'm gonna be posting these diagrams um, in, the, uh, in the library on a post. So you can do the dissection yourself and really soak in all of these layers one at a time. All right. Okay, so Rodney, you said, let's listen, a love supreme. Yeah, we can we can all just throw on a love supreme. Um, let's do it after the fact so that I don't get demonetized <laughs> by playing it in this video um, with the YouTube and it's uh, amazing technology. But yes, there's there is some really good music that we can all enjoy after this. Um, okay, so um, Kenneth, you said, hi, Mike, it's been a long time since I've been able to check in. Thank you for checking in, it's good to have you here. So this is probably a moot question, but I was wondering if you have the color wheel available for purchase. So this circle of fifths, this chord map is, so it's in the shop. If you go to mycolormusic.com, uh, you can uh, get one, it's a functional circle of fifths. Uh, so you can play around with chord progressions in any key modes in any key. It's also instrument agnostic in that it applies to the guitar, piano, ukulele, whatever whatever it is you play. Uh, so long answer to short question, yeah, you can get it uh, on the website. And there's also a link in the video notes to check that out. Thanks for your question. Um, let's see, so uh, Scott. So I don't quite understand it all yet, but it's like a Stargate and it can be opened. Yes, uh, it really is. So the fact that we're just talking about color illustrating music is far out, you know, but none of us have to be wearing a tinfoil hat to see it, that <laughs> the natural patterns of color perfectly match the natural patterns of music. That in and of itself is awesome. But then once you actually jump into the Stargate, as you say, and explore these patterns, they explain everything uh, when it comes to music. Uh, everything like it's it's there's not a glitch there's not like a ah uh, but or any exception there's no asterisk this explains everything and what's really cool is that all of these patterns are fractal they're symmetrical they're cyclical they're geometric and they're wonderful let's see um yes you're totally right and um okay so let's get into I'm leaving Scott your yes on there because it's it's such a beautiful word. Supposedly, 
this is a total tangent, but supposedly that is the the word that John Lennon saw that made him fall in love with Yoko Ono. There was a he was at this modern art exhibit that she was putting on. There was a ladder and there was a telescope at the top of the ladder pointing at some point on the wall. And so he climbed the ladder is one of her exhibits. He looked through the telescope and it was just the word yes printed in small letters on the wall. All right. So, uh, oh, that's awesome. So, John, you said I wrote a biography of Train uh, back in the 90s, now out of print. 20 years later, I discovered that he and Alice are buried 20 feet from my parents. That's amazing. What a small world. Um, and that's really cool. So, uh, yeah, 40 years is too young uh, to, to pass on. But it's amazing. It's amazing what you can do in such a short life. So I'm grateful we're all here right now. That's really cool. Um, okay, so Potato, you said, what I find difficult is mapping the chords onto piano keys. I don't know well. It's easy to do on C and A. Yeah, uh, so definitely check out uh, the videos. There's like a playlist here on the channel that gets into chords on piano. And then also in the library, there's a whole playlist on chords and piano chords and all of that using these geometric uh, patterns, all of these cyclical relationships and much more to come as well. Um, but it all has to do with like intervals, uh, like tertian intervals of thirds that you'll see uh, explain all that. Um, all right. Hey, Alapico, it's very cool. Thanks for joining and aloha to you as well. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, that, that really is, as Virtuous Heretic says, that is wild. Uh, that's a really cool, cool background there. Um, all right. So that one, Geo Girl, you really do a good job in color music. Well, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, and I'm glad that you're here. Um, okay. So Kenneth, you said, uh, since I have you here, so another question for you, Mike, is it safe to assume that one can use any uh, same chord from other scales as a transition to a new scale? I hope that makes sense. So, um, in let's let's use the circle of fifths as a way to illustrate this. So, uh, to transition to a new scale. So, let's say we have C Ionian. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the seven chords of the the key of C major. And if we wanted to shift into the key of G major, which is G, A, B, C, D, E minor, F sharp diminished in G, those two keys, let's just keep the numerals uh, on C, but between those two, those two keys, they share A minor, E minor, C, and G. So you can use those, the, the overlapping, it's like a Venn diagram. So using those two overlapping keys, those chords that are shared between them are like portals, like wormholes between two galaxies to use <laughs> different metaphors, to mix metaphors between Venn diagrams and galaxies is that there are shared chords. Um, and, and I'm just using C and G as an example, but you know, between C and F, they share D minor, A minor, F and C. Um, and, and there's another video that we've done talking about borrowed chords and transitions between different keys um, so that's one way. Those are some borrowed chords or the, using the inherent overlap between keys to transition between keys, the chords between those keys. But then there are other ways to do it too, um, which have to do with even further out. Like you could, you know, play a B flat. If you're in the key of C and you play a B flat or a flat major seven, that's a borrowed chord from, from Mixolydian. It's also a chord in Dorian that you could, that you could, play to like shift between modes, um, which are permutations of other keys. So that's what I mean is music is fractal in that it, it like there it's multi-layered. It's amazing because we're just using 12 notes. It's amazing how much you can do with just 12 notes, but because music is fractal, that's why you can do so much with it. Um, so yes, you can use any chord, uh, any of the same chord from any of the scales as a transition into a new scale. When we do that transition, we are changing the tonic, meaning the point of resolution or the tonal home base. So there is, the, you factor that in as well, um, so that when you land, 
into a different key or a different mode, it feels cohesive and there's a, a tonal point of gravity to work with. And, and we can talk about um, that more in some videos, but that's a good question. Um, okay, I love to see that, Rick in the morning, that makes sense now. I'm not sure I'm because I'm behind on the comments, but whatever it was, I'm glad it makes sense. <laughs> um, the frustration of the confusion of music, like I say, is, is a dilemma and an ir ironic one at that when it comes to music. Um, so, okay, so yeah, that's, uh, we got some good, cool comments. Oh yeah, so this is cool. So Potato, did you hear about the 432 Hertz uh, is the magic tuning? Yeah, there's a really cool video I saw a couple months ago, uh, amazing illustrations uh, talking about 432 and all of the different cosmic equations and seeming coincidences across cultures and uh, ways of getting at 432. I should talk about that in another video. Um, but yeah, that's super cool. Uh, the, the universe is a beautiful place. Um, okay, so Tony, you said, so I think I am close to understanding this, but it is like making sense of a bowl of spaghetti. Do you recommend a more simple footsteps to grasp? Yes. So I'm talking about, you know, and we're talking about the double power of, you know, <laughs> the, the ma magical marriage between the pentagram and the hexagram. And there's a lot of like, we're throwing out a lot of syllables here, right? But really, when it gets down to it, it has to do with whole steps and half steps, which are the fundamental intervals of music. And in the library um, at mycolormusic.com, there is a playlist, uh, a music theory course playlist that starts at square one, assuming no background knowledge, because that's the worst is when you're supposed to know something that you don't know. And so in the instruction, I hate instruction manuals that say, okay, so assuming, you know, this, this, and this, let's start here. And I'm like, I, but I don't know this, this, and this. So definitely check out the music theory course. It starts with no expectation of background knowledge and uh, builds from there. So every concept builds on the last, uh, like I said, I just posted lesson 14 and lesson 15 is posting this month. And uh, we just keep going. We're wrapping up part four, about to enter part five, and there's a lot of good stuff there. So definitely recommend checking it out. Um, all right, so uh, you said, Dave Suda, it seems E flat major scale plays over C Ionian and uh, A flat minor, do you agree? So let's look at the circle of fifths. So uh, the E flat major scale, so we're gonna come to the um, E flat major scale, but we're gonna leave C as the minor one because that is C Eolian. So there is a relationship between C and E flat in the sense that C minor is the relative minor of, of uh, E flat. And uh, you said it seems E flat major scale plays well over C Ionian, yeah, and A minor. Yeah, and since A minor, is the relative minor of C. Like if we if we keep this grouping the same and we rotate, we rotate the one so that it's over, uh, that it aligns with A minor, that's Aeolian. So there's this relationship and it has to do with lots of overlapping geometries here, but A flat and E flat, you know, are tritones but the major to the minor forms this square or this right angle. It's part of a square. And so it gets to that underlying geometry because there's the relationships between minor thirds, major thirds, which are tertian intervals and how chords are formed and then how they're related in the circle of fifths. All that to say, yes, there are special relationships between those patterns that you just pointed out. Um, it's amazing how it all works. Um, okay, so last couple of questions here and then, or comments, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Kenneth, you said, uh, thank you so much. Absolutely love your ability to communicate these concepts. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate your feedback. And I'm so happy you're here uh, that we're geeking out together. Uh, yeah, giant steps, many vibes. Uh, John Coltrane is amazing. And uh, then, uh, Potato, do you think Locrian mode is usable, or would you say that it's just leftover remainder from the other modes? Bjork would, would contend that Locrian is usable. I haven't done a video on Locrian specifically yet, but there will be more on that. Um, it's definitely the runt of the group as it comes to modes. 
And that one geo girl can't wait for lesson 15. Awesome. I can't wait either. It's, it's coming along well. And uh, I'll have more on that as it's, as it comes out. So thank you for joining. John Coltrane is amazing. This diagram is really cool. And uh, there's definitely something to the geometry of music. So more to come. I'm going to post this, uh, all these diagrams in the library. So you can take this in all at your own pace. And again, if you're part of the replay crew, let us know where you're coming from. And thank you. We will talk very soon. We'll see you.